Red Cave Podcast. Reading tonight from Tales from the Cracks, episode 4 through 6. Starting with, every time a fictional character dies, a reptilian is born. Followed by, Ghost Me, a backroom story. And concluded with, Under Construction. Yet, if you enter the woods of a summer evening late, when the night air cools on the trout-ringed pools, where the otter whistles his mate, they fear not men in the woods, because they see so few. You will hear the beat of a horse's feet and the swish of a skirt in the dew, steadily cantering through the misty solitudes, as though they perfectly knew the old lost road through the woods, but there is no road through the woods. Rudyard Kipling. Every time a fictional character dies, a reptilian is born. Connor stopped writing his stories in the first person point of view, and not because of the negative reviews that he was receiving on his internet blog. Of course, he could understand their gripes, as he had admittedly used I as the first word in every story he'd ever written, some 47 of them over the course of the year. He'd been able to churn out so many stories for this very reason, as the I was a very useful strategy in his attempts to get into his main character's head. In fact, his stories might as well have been taken directly from his daily journal, as they were all true eyewitness accounts from his dreams. As much as he wanted to respond to his fans' criticisms and assure them that the stories were all first person because they were his own experiences, he kept this little caveat to himself, as he wasn't sure how that would change the dynamic between him and his audience. He wasn't certain what that would do for his own mental well-being, finally owning up to the fact that his every sleeping night was marked by jarring nightmares that would make the most calloused slasher film lover cringe. The second most common criticism was that all of his main characters died at the end, and he wasn't sure how he could remedy this either. It had been his conviction since starting the Insomniac's quarterly blog that he would recount his dreams true to how he lived them. And the truth was that he died every night in his sleep. He never died of an accident, stepping off a cliff, or driving his car into a tree. No, he was murdered every time, and always at the hands of an unseen monster. Interestingly enough, he never received comments from people demanding to know what the monster looked like, or why it was even hunting the protagonist. It was the unseen predator that made his flash fiction enjoyable. Connor had a fine way of articulating his antagonist using the other senses. The smell of rotting vegetation, the sound of short whistling gasps, like the suction of air through a gas mask, and the humid heat that radiated from the creature. And it always receded into Connor's blind spot, no matter where he found himself in his dreams. An amusement park at night, a boat in the middle of the water, an abandoned supermarket, it didn't matter. Sometimes Connor even remembered previous dreams while ducking through the aisles of a store or stupidly cramming into a roller coaster car idling on the track. He'd think to look behind him, to keep his head on a swivel, as his dad would say, but the creature knew just when to sidestep away, breathing first on the back of his neck with his compost heap breath and then on the side of the face. The monster was always close enough for him to feel its weight shift on the floor he was standing on or hear the hard pat of its seemingly bare feet on the surface. A slap if the concrete was smooth enough or a weighted scuffle of dirt or leaves if the earth was overgrown. His audience liked to speculate on what it could be, but Connor never once dared. To visualize it would be to give it life, or so he feared, as his most chatty of contributors argued on what species of Bigfoot it was, he quickly skimmed those comments and moved on, as he was most afraid that following their train of logic would inevitably result in a face-to-face -face meeting with the thing. As most of the others from the scattered corners of the globe indulged in these fantasies, Connor was content with the mystery, and he wouldn't have even named the monster if he hadn't read the wrong comment one night 
One sleepless night at 3 a.m. as he was uploading his most recent decapitation in a condemned summer camp. From one of his returning readers, Dem Bones 32 he read the life-changing comment, Careful, every time a fictional character dies, a reptilian is born. This comment affected Connor so profoundly that he opened the chat function on his website and sent out a direct call to his anonymous user's handle. He didn't have to wait long, huddled there in the blue light of his laptop, in his dark kitchen, and when the internet personality replied, it was with all the casualty of an old friend. In response to Connor's request for a follow-up, Dem Bones wrote the following. The reptilians live in a higher dimension of thought forms and imagination. They sometimes burrow in our dreams when they want a safe place to feed. They are attracted to bad dreams in particular that feature a lot of death, as they use that louche, or negative energy, to reproduce and lay their eggs in your personal astral bubble. They love writers the most because they live in that realm all the time, experimenting with tragedy and hopelessness. I was just warning you, as it sounds like you have an infestation. How do you know all this? Connor wrote back. Instantly, he saw the little hourglass icon turning below his question to indicate his pen pal was writing him. I used to write. I still read horror, obviously, but I couldn't participate in it anymore. I had the same kind of dreams. That is what you're writing, correct? I used to treat my blog as my own personal dream journal, and that's when I knew I had to stop. What happened? They never became anything more than dreams, did they? The next five minutes waiting for his response were the most excruciating moments of Connor's life, and the answer did little to slow his ragged breathing. Just consider stopping. Start writing other things. You have to tell me what happened. The eggs hatched, and Connor watched his name drop from the leaderboard, which told him the anonymous reader had logged off for the night. Deciding that he wouldn't sleep that night, Connor pored over material on the internet, searching out methods for eradicating astral eggs from his auric field. As he would later regret, Connor clicked on the first series of enchantments spelled out on a Wicca blog that hit all the same keywords as Dem Bones. He immersed himself in a steaming bath with Himalayan rock salt and essential oils. He lit a single red candle and placed it near the faucet, and then he leaned a pocket mirror against the candle. Then he filled the room with smoke, which he accomplished by burning the remaining bundle of musk incense at the bottom of the bathroom drawer. As he eased into the bath, he was careful not to nudge the candle or mirror into the water with him. As instructed, he narrowed his eyes, relaxed considerably, and gazed with his blurring vision into the mirror at his own reflection in the dark bathroom, accentuated in the dancing yellow candlelight. The instructions were explicit that once his eyes had relaxed enough, the candlelight combined with the twisting smoke provide a kind of spiritual lens through which he would be able to decipher his own aura. The reptilian eggs would appear as glowing orbs the size of marbles and the consistency of water droplets, and often congregated along the crown chakra, near the top of the head, but sometimes danced along the forehead like extra eyes. The only way to rid the field of the parasites was to light a match as close to the skin as possible and burn them away. As he lay there in the cooling water with pink skin and a book of matches close to hand, he thought he could smell the familiar stench of rotting vegetation, just fragments breezing past his nostrils. And then something stirred in the kitchen, a soft pad pad, and then the ruffle of his hallway rug as something seemingly tripped over it and bunched it up against the wall. Connor snapped out of his meditation with an ear trained toward the closed and latched door, but he did not hear any other noises. Returning his gaze to the mirror, he began to see twinkling lights flickering and slicing with the candlelight and he focused his gaze, his hands ready with the matches. Blindly, he shook one out and pressed it between the book in the striking strip, ready to yank it toward him in a chemical reaction of fire. Something about the sudden pause in the hallway outside his door told him that he had limited time and needed to act fast. 
The smell of the monster had become even stronger now that the incense sticks had reached their ashy nubs. Then he felt a hot breath of air against the top of his head, just teasing his bangs and scalp. He knew enough from his dream records that it was unwise to look up, as the thing always shifted its position, usually much closer and primed and ready to strike. And now that this was not a dream, it was not his intention to challenge anything he had time and time surrendered his life to. The lights twinkled again, much brighter this time, and he likened them to fat fireflies buzzing around his temples, exactly like the sight had described them. He moved instinctively, and the match exploded in his hand. Moving fast, but not fast enough to extinguish the flame, he raised the light and heat to his forehead and watched the fireflies shrink away, as if in pain, and then reduce to pinpricks, like diodes dimming on a circuit board. As soon as the match burned down to his fingertips, the hot breath from above had abated, and the lights reflecting in the mirror had completely dissipated. He waited a long ten minutes gazing into the glass and soaking in absolute silence before he was sure that the astral eggs had diminished to nothing. Then he heard a ding on his computer, and he knew Dem Bones had chimed in again. He hurried to dry himself in his towel, and he wasn't even thinking about his midnight visitor when he burst out into the empty hall and huddled in front of his computer, half naked and dripping. Sorry, Dem Bones had come back with. My internet connection went out mysteriously. I was going to say, don't try removing the eggs yourself. The best way to rid yourself of the passengers is to stop writing scary stories and focus on the true, the innocent, and the beautiful for a while. The eggs will shrivel on their own. Interfering with them in any way will cause them to hatch as a defense mechanism. Good luck, man. I really did think you wrote some good stuff. Then something splashed in the bathroom, and he felt sharp talons bite into the back of his neck. Connor started out of his sleep, the water slowly sloshing out around him as it flooded the floor and extinguished the candle on the tub edge. A dream! Looking over at the incense sticks burning by the wall-length mirror, Connor realized that it had been about 30 minutes, as the sticks were halfway burned. How much of it had been a dream, though? He wondered if the computer had really dinged some time in his sleep. So he struggled his way out to check the computer, but the screen was black and it did not switch on when he pushed the power button. Had he really lit the match to ward off the eggs? He supposed that he hadn't dreamed the interaction with Dem Bones, but how could he be sure with a dead computer? Back in the bathroom, he searched the pooling water to find the book of matches, and there was indeed one missing. He found the bent and spent piece of matchstick curled around the edges among the rest of the scattered refuse, and he knew that he had followed through with the ritual, for better or worse. In the living room, his computer rang again, and his heart did a quick up and down in his throat. He had never crept as slowly back toward his desk, where his screen was very much alive with light. Bending down in front of the computer, he read the newest message from Dem Bones. You can only see the reptilians or their kin in your dreams, but don't go looking for them or you'll never wake up. The computer lid slammed shut in front of him with such force that the plastic snapped in half and the entire room shook. The last thing he saw before waking in the tub again was a scaly arm ending at a gnarled claw digging its barbs into his oaken desk. Back in the sloshing tub, he looked once again at the half-burned incense sticks and used matchbook and knew that he was in another dream, but he was reluctant to speculate on how he would ever wake from this hellish loop. What if there was only one way out? He decided he would stay there for a moment with his legs stretched out as far as they would go and the sweat pouring off his brow from the water's high temperature. The true, the innocent, and the beautiful, he thought to himself. Whatever that was, it would ward off the passengers, as Dem Bones referred to them. He started thinking of flowers, sunshine, waterfalls in the mist, and children chasing butterflies. At the least, he hoped this would rouse him from his sleep, returning him to his body, wherever that might be. God, he prayed that wouldn't be the half-filled bathtub in his bachelor studio apartment. Please be in my bed, he thought to himself, or in the bed of someone I love. 
Bubbles began to tickle the inside of his leg, and even before opening his eyes, he was screaming at the top of his voice, until it shredded away into a bloody gurgle that left him gasping and choking for life. His legs were no longer stretched out but pulled all the way toward his chest as he shriveled away from the ridged snout, poking out of the water and gaining height as the emerald-colored creature raised itself up on its haunches. He saw its crocodile smile bending along the surface of the clear water, and its yellow eyes stared big and unblinking in the jagged candle shadows. He screamed but did not wake up, and it continued to stand upright, the water pouring off and its mouth gaping open like the trap that it was. The steamy breath washed over him as its sandpaper tongue probed against his closed eyelids. The trap closed around his neck, and he did not wake up in the bathroom, or anywhere for that matter. And he never posted another story to his blog leaving his diminishing fan base to speculate on what monster finally got him. A skinwalker? The Grace? Or maybe the Rake? Of course, Dem Bones 32 knew what got him, but he never joined in with his peers on the dead author's website, which would surely disappear at the end of the month when no one paid the $25 for the domain. No, he just moved on to the next horror writer's blog, as he was most certainly needed there. One of these days, someone would listen and heed his warning. Dem Bones liked a good scary story, like anyone, even if that meant the eventual gruesome death of all his favorite writers. They were most assuredly all dead. Roast me. Sometimes those who wander are lost, read the final text he ever sent to Lana. It had been a long week since his final correspondence, and the countless texts and voice messages she had relinquished on him had only piled up as an impassable rout of emotional water in her chest. After only a few months dating, Andrew had stopped answering her, and that final response had served as a digging thorn that she had dissected to no end. She had simply been quoting one of her favorite expressions, sometimes those who wander are not lost, and he had replied with the complete inverse of this foundational statement of her life puzzling her for hours and days with no end. She had replied back with, LOL, you know what I mean, hoping that it had only been a quippy joke that hadn't landed, and he was waiting to follow up with the real punchline. When he didn't respond, she came to believe that he had been geared toward hurting her the entire time, and the next string of texts she sent to his unresponsive phone followed the five stages of grief to a T. After giving him the benefit of the doubt, she then became angry, and then started bargaining, pleading for response of any kind. Then depression fell over her like a blanket, and her girlfriend Stacy quickly noticed this one day as they were sitting down at the mall's food court one afternoon. Just goes to show how much you can really know someone, Stacy said, furrowing her brow as she worked with the memory in her head, or perhaps the smoothie she had already inhaled had caused her mind to freeze over. I'm glad I never met him, or maybe I should have. You know I have a great nose for creeps. Alana sighed, fiddling with her full, untouched plastic cup of water she'd gotten at the smoothie shop. I didn't introduce you to him for that very reason. You're too judgmental. Well, I should have saved you some time. How many times did you actually meet? Once, two times, and always in front of his house? Anyone who doesn't invite you in is hiding something. He had roommates, Alana argued. I've done similar things with my boyfriends. He didn't want his slob friends to be my first impression of him. How can you still be defending a guy who ghosted you? You've never told a boy you love him before, so don't ask me again why I'm worried about the boyfriend I haven't talked to in a week. Fine, if you're so worried for him, then go to his house. Maybe his roommates have killed him and are eating him as we speak. Would that make you feel better? Alana slammed down her water cup so hard that it cracked and bled over the table. You don't think I've thought about that? Stacy laughed and scooted her chair away from the table in case Alana decided to toss the rest of the water into her heavily blushed cheeks. That his roommates are eating him? No! Going to his house. I've thought about confronting him, but I don't think I can face off with someone who's already moved on. I won't put myself through that. Stacy frowned when the fun of her button pressing had run its course. But what if he really is in trouble? Hell, his grandma could have been in the hospital for the week. I think you owe it to yourself to at least put that question to bed. 
Maybe he's laid up in bed, and there's room for one more. Fuck off, Alana grunted as she slouched down all the way into her uncomfortable metal chair. Is it worth pursuing peace of mind if it proves to me he's just a jerk? Yes, Stacy said seriously. Girl, the truth hurts. But you know me, I'll never know how to mind my own business. And if you don't go, I might just have to. You gave me an unsolved mystery. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? You're right. Alana smirked for the first time that day. I'll never hear the end of it. If you really love the guy, trust him, she said. And that's the only time you'll hear me give such good advice. She tossed the empty cup over her shoulder and missed the trash can completely. Alana's hatred for Andrew was quickly replaced with concern for his well-being. And although Stacy had insisted on following her to the house, Alana braved the wintry streets alone, riding the bus across town to the old side, and arrived at Andrew's house, an adobe-style domicile with an impressive collection of junk and trash littering the front porch. It did look like a group of young male roommates shared the house, as leaves clogged the gutters, paint peeled from the trim, and the lawn had been left to grow wild. Trying her best to suffocate her fear with the love that still sat tender in the seat of her chest, she approached the front porch and knocked on the door. No one answered. Not even a dog barked from the other side, even though Andrew had claimed that one of his roommates owned a pet. She thought about calling his number and listening with her ear to the door to see if she could hear it ringing from the other side, but quickly shook her head at her own self. She tried. There was really nothing else she could do short of banging the door down. As she was walking away, she watched someone clanging with the gate at the bottom of the walk. Adrenaline quickly spiked her blood, but it wasn't Andrew who approached her on the concrete path. Automatically, she assumed it was one of his roommates, and she racked her brain for one of their names as she made eye contact with the man, who wore a full beard and a navy blue pantsuit. He also had one of those professional businessman haircuts she'd seen in commercials for her local law firms. With the perfect ratio of buzz job and gel parting hairline along the right side of the head, Alana's first thought was how handsome and tall this man truly was, most likely in his late 20s, while she was only 19. She almost forgot this fact when she saw the bouquet of flowers in his hand and automatically assumed they were for her. Oh, hello, are you one of Tina's friends? He asked, smiling politely but not offering the flowers or any kind of handshake her way. He stopped about six feet away from her, even as she stupidly continued on until they were in breathing distance. Tina? She asked with a fumbling voice to match her feet. Yeah, I just assumed, but there are enough people living in that house for me to assume incorrectly, he offered. This time he did hold up his hand as she gratefully shook it. It was as warm and thick as she'd hoped it was. The name's James, he said, and she told him hers. I'm Tina's boyfriend. I assume you must be one of... Travis's friends? Or maybe Andrew? Her eyes flashed with recognition for the first time. Yes, she barked too excitedly for her visitor's volume level. Well, sort of friends. We used to date. The tall man frowned down at her, allowing his gaze to drift slightly to rest on the house. Sorry to hear that. I'm not sure what Tina and I are anymore either. Alana filed that info away in her head for future knowledge mentally kicking herself for not putting more effort into her makeup and hair for the day. She was still wearing her dog-chewed moccasins for pity's sake. I was just coming by to reconcile, he said. I don't know if you know her at all. No, I haven't met any of Andrew's roommates, she shot back at once. Well, it isn't like her to ignore me like she has been. I'm here to get to the bottom of it. He shrugged with his flowers in hand. Am I going too far, Alana? You're gonna think I'm lying, Alana said, finding it almost impossible to swallow the hot barb in her throat. But I'm here for the same reason. Really? How so? Andrew hasn't been answering my texts either. Now James really looked concerned, and he proceeded past her to toss the flowers in the trash heap and knock roughly on the door until it shook in its frame. Alana came up behind him, swaying back and forth uncertainly. Y you think they're in trouble then? Tina, Andrew, and what was his name? Yes, I think they're in trouble, he replied without meeting her eyes, and he did not waste a moment in pushing open the door to reveal a living room that matched the porch outside. Dirty dishes and trash were piled on every surface, including the top of the tube TV and the speakers of the ancient and dust-encrusted stereo. I had no idea this is how he lived, Alana said. 
Seeing that it was an adobe style house, there was no second floor, so they wasted no time in covering every square inch, and this was not a difficult task. There was only one bedroom in the house, which was most concerning to Alana and James. You haven't been in here either then? She asked him. No, she always came over to my place. I picked her up here though. He replied distractedly as he closed the door on the bedroom. It didn't look like anyone had slept on the floor mattress in decades, and the trash and piles of crumpled cardboard boxes made it impossible to enter anyway. Why would they tell us they lived in this squalor hole? Alana questioned. So they could ghost us later, I guess, he said with a quickly fading voice. If we went looking for them, they could just disappear. Alana's eyes were drawn to the tube television when it flickered for a moment with static. She squared herself up in front of the screen, inspecting her own reflection in the glass. Who the hell still has a tube TV? She asked herself. She used the power button and felt a mechanism slide and trigger underneath her with the trapdoor that gave way and sent her plummeting onto the hard floor below. She hadn't fallen far, just enough to turn her ankle and bring stars to her vision as she collected in a ball. She looked up instantly at the letterbox square of light, some twelve feet high, and the ceiling above her. Everything else around her was shadows that danced with a far-off flickering light. James poked his head through the opening, but his face was too dark to determine what he was thinking. He certainly wasn't calling down to her. James, she screamed. What? Please help me. I'm sorry, Alana, but there's only one way out of here, he explained calmly. You gotta follow the hallways. Find Andrew and bring him back. That's why you're here. What are you? She screamed. You did this? No, I only rigged the trapdoor for people like you, like me, he said. I was led to this house too, the hell if I know why. But there was a door in the floor, the one you just fell through. I never went down, but I've heard Tina down there, screaming. Find her and Andrew and bring them back to this door. Then he pulled away and left her to scream until she lost her voice, jumping with all her strength at the escape hatch just beyond reach. And when she checked her phone, she saw that she had no reception. Her only choice from there was to follow the flickering hallway, with burned out lights in the ceiling that still buzzed from dirty electricity. The single claustrophobic hallway opened into an office or a reception area of some kind, but there were no pieces of furniture, ringing phones, or doors leading to offices. At least here there were lights, but they dried out her eyes and filled her head with static that seemed to cancel out her thoughts. The reception area opened into several passageways all leading to more rooms of differing sizes, carpets, and colored paint. But these slight derivations in decor were so slight that she almost missed the changes, from off-color white to eggshell, from shag carpeting to popcorn ceilings, but there were never any windows. Everything still had that mothball smell and waiting room atmospheres. All the while she screamed for help, navigating from one room to the next and not caring that she was hopelessly lost. At least every room she entered was different, as she assured herself, and that told her she was progressing. After passing through the fifth room, she came to a passage fully in the dark. Up until that point she had insisted on following a straight line through the labyrinth in case she wanted to backtrack, but now she would have to choose one of the left or right branches. She decided that she would rather turn back completely and hope that someone on the street could hear her cries. There was no telling how far this underground complex stretched, and when she checked her phone, she saw that nothing had changed. The minute she took it out, she watched another screen light up in the dark hall directly in front of her. It was enough light to illuminate the face of a young woman staring back at her. Hi, she said, and even though Alana had already seen her before she spoke, she jumped. I have a phone here we've been using. You can use that if you like. Who? Alana stared desperately down at the screen in her own hand, there in the middle of the empty room, and her voice returned to her after bouncing back from down one of the far passageways. I'll trade you, the girl said, in the cast of her cell phone light. It doesn't work for us anymore, but it should for you. How do you know? Alana managed. The old phone works briefly for every newcomer, but your new one should work for me. I can call anyone you want. I can probably get you help. Who are you? Alana asked. Tina, the girl responded. James is up there. He, he trapped me down here, the girl nodded. He sent the last few down here searching for me, she explained dryly. He's a complete psycho. I'm sorry I ever started texting him. You know, he's the one who trapped Andrew down here, as he was jealous I was texting him. He's down here with you? Where? 
hiding. We take our turns with the phone, Tina went on. Whoever has the new one can leave this place for a while. I spend my time with boys I like, just like Andrew hits up the girls. But there are a few of us down here, like you, Alana. We take our turns. So you'll get the phone soon, or the next one, when it stops working for the rest of us. How do you get out? Show me. We just kind of wake up in the house above us. It's not something we can control, it just happens. But the only way we can leave is by contacting someone on the surface. That establishes a real connection. Makes us real again. Solid. With the phone? Alana brandished it at her shadowed visitor. It has no reception. I'm telling you, it'll work for us, Tina explained. That's how Andrew contacted you with this phone, which we traded with the last girl who came down here. Girl? What girl? We never learned her name, but she's got to be around here somewhere, Tina replied with the same emotionless candor. No one dies down here. They just get lost. They run off and can't find their way back. Run off? Here, I'll toss you the phone. We'll slide them across the floor at the same time. Her face stuck away as she bent over to place the phone screen up on the carpet. She prepared to slide it. Why would I give you my phone? Alana snapped. Because it's the only way any of us can contact the outside world. Once one of us takes it back up to the surface, we'll charge it and then it should work for you. But you have to give it away. Will you text my friend Stacy for me? It's unlocked and she's one of the only contacts. Just let her know I'm alive under Andrew's house. Will you let her know? I will, Tina said straight-facedly. Slide it on three. And your phone still has charge? It hasn't been to the surface for a week or so, but it has a half charge. Ready? Lana placed her own phone on the carpet and slid it across the way on the count of three with Tina. She watched it disappear into the darkness and was surprised when the other phone, an old clamshell, bounced off her sneaker. She was about to call after Tina, but she had already disappeared with her phone. Call Stacy, you promised. Alana shot after her. Then she checked the flip phone at her feet and saw that it indeed had reception. A few bars and a half charge as promised. Looking at the contact list, there were a few saved numbers, including hers, and she followed the script of her text message conversation with Andrew for a few beats before one of the battery bars blinked out of existence. Without another thought, she punched in Stacy's number from her memory and called it. Her friend answered on the third ring with a mouth full of something, berating the unknown robo-caller for disturbing her bath time. Stacy, it's me, Alana, calling from another phone, she yelled into the receiver. She had already turned on her heel to follow the straight line of hallways back to what she could only hope was the way she came in. Alana, what the hell? Where are you? I can barely hear you. Are you talking through one of those tin can shoestring phones? I'm underground in some complex. It's never ending. I'm... What? I can't hear you. You're where? Underground. I don't know. Under Andrew's house. I'll text you the address. Andrew, is this his phone? But her voice died in mid-sentence, and Alana looked at the black screen to see the battery had officially died. And then the room shook so violently with what sounded like the thundering footsteps of a giant that the lights dimmed a few levels. Her first instinct was to run through endless halls, searching the ceiling for the trapdoor but never finding it, even as she passed through the fifth room that should have contained her one exit. So she kept running, and the footsteps thundered so loudly that blue emergency lights switched on. Then she started fleeing down any passageway she could find, just to put as much space between her and those approaching footfalls as possible. But she soon learned that she was running toward them when a hulking mass the size of a pickup truck filled up the ceiling-high doorway in front of her, and its black, featureless face screamed with a voice she could only attribute to a prehistoric dinosaur from the movies. Claws gripped the underside of the doorway as it ducked its massive head under for a closer look at her, and a silver and white reflective revolving disc opened where its face should have been, expanding and narrowing at its apex like a funnel full of needlepoint teeth. She didn't even realize that she had dropped the phone as she took off the other way, screaming, crying, and then suddenly quiet. Her voice receded into the darkness with her haphazard steps, and the room swallowed everything else. Before a clawed foot smashed the hard plastic into splinters in the shag, a single message lit up the screen from Stacy, delivered somehow, but unread. Under construction. Ho, oh, halt there! The officer shouted. He held his hands out to John like two makeshift stop signs. 
John pulled his Chevy to the side of the road, his snow tires crunching softly over the scattered gravel. The police officer started toward John, waving for him to roll down his window. He did so, and the man bent down to John's height, his face masked by a set of comically large black sunglasses. The policeman was balding, his black, stringy hair sticking up in untidy spikes. His pudgy cheeks were rosy from the cool temperature outside, and his double chin rolled past his thick neck like a sagging sack. The cop leaned in through the window, his fat gut pressing against the door. His face was inches from John's nose, and he was able to watch his uncomfortable reflection swim crazily in the sunglasses. The cop panted heavily. Nos way is closed for constriction, sir. John blinked slowly, his head edging into the headrest of the seat as the man leaned even closer. What? Castle Lake is closed? John asked. Castle Lake Road was a steep mountain pass winding up the side of Black's Peak. From the overhanging cliff, inches from the right side of the road, a stunning view of the entire Rocky Mountains was clear. Forests of plush spruces and aspens speckled the sloping foothills and mountains like pepper. That day, John was headed up to Ray's Park to meet his buddy for a weekend of camping and hunting. Yet, Castle Lake was suddenly closed, the only road up to Ray's Park. Yes, sir, can't you see the constriction tape up there? The cop asked. He pointed at the neon tape roping off the road. Beyond the tape, there were two workers staring at him, hammers and drills in hand. They were holding the tools when there seemed to be no real construction in effect. What happened to the road? John asked. Joust some light reconstriction, sir. I get that, but sir, you're gonna have to torn a rat go back, he added, starting to step away. Listen, officer, I really need to get to Ray's Park by seven, so could you please let me slip by? John asked. His face was scrunched up to show remorse. I have some company waiting for me up there. Absolutely not. The road is torn up, the cop snapped. John looked back at the road and saw that it was smooth as ever. But nothing is really... Sir, torn around. This isn't the way you're going. The cop turned from John's car and strode away toward the construction site. As he walked back, John noticed something odd about the cop's uniform he hadn't studied before. He realized it wasn't a police uniform at all, and he did a quick double take. The man's uniform pants were now acid-washed jeans, and he wore a faded gray undershirt. His feet were clad in rubber snow boots instead of polished dress shoes. The cop's belt, which was only a leather strap to a purse, was tied with a sloppy knot. Hanging from the leather strap was an airsoft gun. He could tell from its colored tip. Officer? John asked through the window. The man turned like a top and John gasped. He wore a gray police uniform with iron dress pants and polished black shoes. Around his waist wasn't a leather strap after all. It was a black regulation belt with pouches and holsters. John slumped in his seat, his thoughts spinning in confused revolutions. Had he really seen that fake uniform moments ago? What was happening? Go back, sir, the man said. John gasped again, his jaw hanging open in awe. The oversized sunglasses that had been on the man's face were now gone, revealing beady eyes, one green and one blue. Moments ago, the man had been balding excessively, but now long bangs fell over his dirty forehead. His double chin was gone as well, but he still panted, his large gut convulsing. In stunned silence, John turned his car around and took off the way he'd come. Through the rearview mirror, he saw that the cop and construction workers were watching him go. The sunglasses were again perched on the obese man's nose. Then the construction site blinked out behind a hanging rock cliff. John was almost to the fork that would link Castle Lake and Federal when his cell phone rang. John put it to his ear as he drove, and Eddie spoke softly from the receiver. Almost a race? His friend asked. No, the road's roped off for construction, John explained. I couldn't get through. The road was roped off? It wasn't when I went by some ten minutes ago, Eddie replied. They couldn't have gotten construction going in that amount of time. John hit the brakes, and the car skidded to a stop on the deserted road. You barely passed Castle Lake by the time I got there, John proclaimed. Yeah, I the line cut out and the phone flashed to indicate the loss of service. John set the phone aside and turned the car around a second time. No construction had started in the last ten minutes, John knew for sure. Ten minutes later, John rounded the last bend and spotted the caution tape, fluttering in the breeze. But this time, no one was around. The three men were gone. 
He was just about to speed up dramatically and fly right through the construction tape when a figure emerged out of nowhere. It was as if it had just liquefied from the rock overhang. Jan stomped on the brakes and halted in the street. The figure came into focus, walking carefully into the middle of the road. It was a cop again, but a different one. This man wasn't as fat as the other. He had the same grey uniform and the balding head, but it was blonde. Those same absurd sunglasses were propped on a sharp nose set above a chiseled jaw. Sir, I believe I told you to head back the way you came. John stuck his head out the open window and noticed how, when he spoke, his breath plumed out before him in a cloud. The cops did not. I don't think I've talked to you before, officer. We just talked, sir. Then realization crept over his face and it started to change. The chiseled jaw sagged and the double chin rolled over his fat neck. The cheeks blew out like balloons and the rosy color animated his face. His hair started to grow out over his forehead, creating bangs, and then faded from blonde to black. The cop swiftly whipped off his shades to reveal two different colored eyes. His horrible accent had returned as well. We did talk, sir, the man said. Holy Christ, John barked, punching down on the gas. He went to swerve around, and the cop responded by drawing his revolver like a ready gunslinger. John cried out, ducking his head as the car closed the distance. The policeman fired his weapon. But what discharge was nothing more than an orange airsoft pellet. It bounced off the windshield without harm. John tore through the tape. Through the rearview mirror, he saw that the man was wearing a gray dress shirt and acid-washed jeans. He wore a familiar pair of snow boots with the makeshift leather strap around his waist. There was a glint of reflecting light, and John realized that the sheriff's badge on his left breast was only a crumpled wedge of tinfoil. John continued along the untouched street, his heart racing, his shirt drenched in sweat. The eyes were the only features that had never changed on the man, those piercing, multicolored eyes. The sun was quickly blotted out by the overhanging clouds, leaving the world gray and dull. The cliff walls on the left-hand side started to pulse outward, as if they were rubber. The road had lost its color just like the sky, going from black tar to a faded gray. The outside world began to blur, all its beautiful colors blending into a monotonous blot. His wheel felt like it was drooping through his fingers like wet clay, and his seat was starting to sink through the floor of the car. He never blinked, the road ahead shining with a pleasurable intensity. He was mesmerized by it, hypnotized by its glory. The mountain pass was now a bright, glowing strip in a sea of gray. The trees around him became angry faces that screamed and reached out at the car with brownish fingers. They scraped across the windshield, leaving deep grooves in the glass. John screeched, stomping harder on the accelerator. He was speeding close to 80 miles per hour, but he didn't even notice. In the distance, standing out from the ongoing gray, was an orange sun complete with revolving black moons. This wasn't the Earth's sun. It was a sun from another galaxy. It was as if part of John's world had rubbed off like a smeared fingerprint, and another fingerprint, an alien print, had pressed over it. There was an explosive report that tore through the air. John hit the brakes and the car skidded. At that instant, a silver dish the length and width of two semi-trucks sped by overhead. It passed over John's car, leaving an ear-shattering boom in its wake. John's windshield cracked and blew in from the roar. His eardrums popped and blood squirted down his shoulders and back. The car bucked and rolled onto its side. Steam and fire licked out from the exposed engine as the car came to rest upside down. John fell against his seatbelt, his wrist snapping under the restraining strap. His hair brushed the roof of the cabin, his own cries going unheard. The seatbelt snapped and John fell on his neck. He was sobbing and choking gasps as he crawled out through the shattered windshield. All he could hear was a piercing ring. He tumbled onto the landing strip, which was no longer asphalt, but cold glass. Bits of the windshield dug into his side as he crawled away from the wreckage, and he managed to get back onto his feet, his ankle crying out in pain. His wrist hung loosely by strings of flesh and muscle, his bone exposed through the flow of red. He couldn't move any of the fingers. He looked around him and saw that the cliffs were still present, but black as ash. The trees were scarlet red, their faces frowning solemnly down on him. Their twig fingers reached out, grasping at thin air. John turned to see that the mammoth spacecraft was parked on the runway. A compartment was opening, and a large figure appeared in the doorway. 
Two orange eyes stared out at him. John turned, limping away from the wreck. Some twenty yards away, parked askew on the landing strip, was Eddie's jeep. Inside the car stood a cop dressed in a regulation gray uniform. His face was smooth, no nose, mouth, hair, or ears. There were only two staring eyes, one green and one blue. Its face was milky white and it had no fingers or toes. Its limbs ended in claw-like feet and hands that resembled the blades of a shovel. Its uniform suddenly changed back to the familiar dress shirt and jeans. The airsoft gun hung loosely from its hip, most likely a relic from an unattended garage sale. Then the white creature started to stride forward, claw-like feet patting the runway. Beside this creature came two more, only they were naked, their skinny frames exposing jutting ribs and pelvises. All of them had multicolored eyes. Suddenly the gray sky faded and thinned, the alien world gone. The rocky mountains swam back into view, and the blue sky appeared soon after, a colossal dome. John looked to the jeep and limped after it. Behind him he felt the lumbering footsteps of the creatures from the ship with the orange eyes. It was getting closer each second, but John couldn't look back. It was different from the others, John was certain. It didn't have multicolored eyes, and it was a lot larger. They had been waiting for it to arrive, and now that they were reunited, there was sure to be a plan of action. John sprinted to the side of Eddie's jeep and fumbled inside, while the three white creatures ran at the vehicle. The keys were there in the ignition, the motor still rumbling with life. One of the creatures struck the door, rebounding off it, and yanking at it desperately. John quickly locked the door and spit a mouthful of blood on the window. The monster's eyes shone angrily from the outside, its claw striking the glass. The other monsters were climbing onto the hood of the jeep, and one white arm burst through the windshield with brutal force. John stamped on the gas, and the white aliens rolled over the windshield in black, bloody streaks, striking the pavement on the other end. The alien dressed in the snow boots and jeans hung on to the driver's door like a spider. It crawled across the side of the speeding car, and then found its place atop the hood. One of its claws scoped through the large crack in the windshield. John stepped abruptly on the brake and the creature propelled off the hood and on to the street with a smack. It got up quickly, its eyes blaring with fury as John accelerated. The creature's back snapped and its head collided with the hood, splattering like a melon. Black congealed blood splashed the glass. The lifeless creature rolled over the roof of the jeep, joining its dead friends. John reached the other end of the construction site, the bordering tape flapping helplessly in two pieces on the asphalt. Then a shadow bathed John's vision like a tinted screen. The silver dish was hovering above him, blotting out the sun. He followed the craft with his eyes as it started to descend. John stared off into the sloping landscape of the Rocky Mountains, past the road and its jutting cliff, past the rolling foothills and brightly lit aspen trees of orange and yellow. Clouds swirled and twisted above the snow-covered peaks like reaching fingers. It was a masterpiece, a sheer, uplifting view. He wanted that to be the last thing he saw on Earth. The silver dish came to a stop in the middle of the road, but John never slowed. He never looked at the street or the ship again, only at his breathtaking view. The jeep plowed into the craft with a deafening crunch. The monstrous frame blew outward, its galactic shrapnel raining down on the trees and road with metal flakes of hail. Silence returned to thicken the air as fire enveloped a clear Colorado sky. Tune in next time for Tales from the Cracks, episode 7 through 9. Starting with The Sacrifice of a Sleepwalker. Followed by We Wear Our Sunglasses at Night. And concluded with what dark creature? Until next time, guard your soul.